I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Jack Sarfati, a theoretical physicist specializing in advanced propulsion research. Jack has a PhD in physics from the University of California, taught physics at San Diego State University, worked with David Bohm at the University of London's Burbeck College, and with Abdus Salam at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Jack was the basis of the memorable time-traveling Dr. Emmett Brown in the Back to the Future trilogy, and the author of Super Cosmos, Destiny Matrix, Space Time and Beyond 2, and the co-author with Fred Allen Wolf and Bob Tobin of Space Time and Beyond toward an explanation of the unexplainable. Today, we continue our discussion of concepts in relativistic physics and a new approach to warp drive propulsion that explains the reported flight performance of Tic Tac UAPs. Let's go now to our discussion in progress. Well, so I wanted to ask you about the idea of UAP being a military threat, right? Yeah. It, because I know that's something you've talked about a lot. Yeah. And and now, would that be all UAP or a class of UAP or a type or, or something along those lines? Well, what are your thoughts on that? The whole, all, all of the above, all of the above. Are we recording now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're recording now. Uh, okay, well, let me let me just then maybe just go through the slideshow because that's what it's about. I, you know, I cut this down to just a okay. few slides. Yeah, go for it. All right, so uh, about the military threat. Um, okay, let me, the war in reality. Earth civilization in 2022 is at a turning point, split between irreconcilable competing narratives on many levels, political, cultural, moral, scientific. If the UFO evidence is real, then we do not live in a boring universe. By the way, the term boring universe is from Matt Visser's uh, book on Lorentzian wormholes. Matt Visser is a physicist in New Zealand. He's kind of the top gun in all the um, relevant general relativity research, relevant to wormholes, you know, stargates and warp drives, stuff like that. Um, so the key thing that I want everybody to realize, we're not alone in the universe. We are being visited by more than <clears throat> one kind of advanced intelligence who are able to control gravity with small amounts of energy. That is weightless warp drive, time travel from future to past with no time dilation problem. Not all of them are friendly, though some seem to be. Uh, do you want to make a comment on that, <laughs> Tim? <laughs> or should I go on? No, I would say go for, go for it, sir. Okay. Well, let me go to the next. Um, uh, so this is big. This is major. This is this is this is the biggest thing happening, I think. You know, unless you know, unless everything that you're hearing in the media from Louis Elizondo and Chris Mellon and uh, everyone like that, unless they're pulling the wool over our eyes, which I don't think so, because I've had my own direct, you know, uh, experiences in this field you know, since I was a child, and I'm now uh, going to be 83 years old pretty soon. So um, I don't think that's the case. So this is this is a major, this is like a new Copernican revolution. This is a revolution in reality and how we see the universe and how we see ourselves in the universe. So the, there's nothing bigger than this. It dwarfs all the current political dramas we're meshed in, you know, with the Putin and Ukraine and uh, um, what's happening in, in American politics. I don't want to get into that in any detail. So let me go on to the next slide, see how this goes. Okay, uh, are UFOs a military threat? Let me see if I get this thing to work. Uh, I guess the video's not working. All right, well, I wanted to play a video, that, but um, uh, I won't, so let, let's go on. Uh, uh, we did this last time. This is the famous slide nine that I think uh, has gotten a lot of attention. I think I think Louis Elizondo um, first uh, um, uh, you know, made this this uh, the public aware of this slide, and uh, I think this slide has to be taken very seriously, as I said before, and quite literally. And uh, my point is this: the uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and and other um, um, agencies, uh, ma mainly the um, U.S. Army and the Air Force, uh, 
uh, agents from, from those um, uh, military forces basically recruited me and others um, into studying this problem uh, about 50 years ago. Uh, and part of that story uh, is told by uh, MIT professor David Kaiser in his popular book from 2011, How the Hippies Save Physics. So um, all of this is um, now understood. And I think Louis Elizondo put uh, what was considered phenomena is now quantum physics. And yes, that's true, except a, a slight correction. It's, the, it's not quantum physics. We call it now post-quantum physics because the quantum physics that's being taught in the universities today is a limited theory. We now know there's a much larger theory. Um, and again, the analogy is like with the Einstein's relativity theory. In 1905, Einstein developed his special theory of relativity, which uh, did not include gravitation. And it took, uh, Einstein struggled for about 10 years before he developed his general theory, which is a bigger theory, general theory of relativity that includes the gravitational field, which the uh, special theory of relativity does not include it. In the same way, the uh, quantum physics that is taught in universities today is analogous to Einstein's special theory of relativity because it does not explain consciousness. It, in fact, cannot explain uh, living matter. It only explains dead matter. And it certainly cannot explain um, what uh, Eric Davis and Jacques Vallée and even Colonel John Alexander and others call the high strangeness factor or uh, the paranormal, the paranormal, you know, things like telepathy. And it's, it's quite clear from the UFO evidence that the advanced uh, intelligences that are um, surveilling us, like, uh, by the way, that, that, that the, the video you did with that Irishman was quite good. So we're being surveilled and we, we're, we're being interfered with by these advanced intelligences. And not only do they have a uh, gravity warp drive time travel uh, capability, but they also have mind control capability, which is what this slide is talking about. And uh, so that means, uh, folks, that means, uh, you know, you guys in the Central Intelligence Agency, the uh, <laughs> the uh, DARPA and, uh, and uh, you know, the, the foreign intelligence agencies, uh, our friends at MI6, uh, our friends, the Israeli, the Mossad, and uh, the, uh, the uh, Putins and the Chinese, that uh, you guys are not in control. You're not in control. You may think you're in control, but you're not in control. Now, most a lot of you realize that. And I'm just like letting out the obvious. I mean, Jim, Jim Simivan, who's you know, CIA guy and, and put up, they all realize that. And of course, you've been trying to cover this up. But now, you know, the cat's out of the out of the box, running his cat. <laughs> well, Schroding, it's a lion, it's a tiger. The tiger's out, out of the cage, and you cannot um uh, pretend it's not the case anymore. So this this really affects our politics. What I'm saying right now is extremely important. And well, you, you know, and, and if I could interject, Jack, yeah. I I think one of the things that I'm seeing from from like uh, when I see the news stories on UAP and and the government's response to that, mm -hmm. I I think that there's an awareness that there's a much larger picture that's starting to dawn on lawmakers. You know, I think that this is and probably for society in general, right? Uh, you know, I I think that we we tend to put UFOs or UAP in this box and and then we isolate it from the rest of society. And mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's coming out of these stories is. I think people are starting to gradually realize we are part of something that is much larger, you know, in scope and in time and in focus. And, you know, like that renaming the um, renaming that program Arrow, right? The the all anomaly office. I, I, I think that's that these are these are kind of small steps towards this acknowledgement that there's something big going on. You know. Yeah, well, it, it, this is the biggest thing. <clears throat> this is the biggest thing ever. Once it's realized what, what what's happening, and the problem is right now, um, you know, we have all this infighting even within our own community, um, uh, and I don't want to get into de de details on that. But uh, uh, the message I'm trying to deliver, of course, involves uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance, and you'll have the knee jerk debunkers like. Um, uh, I forget some of these guys' names. I, I don't have to name them. 
Mick West, I guess, people like Mick West, and even my friend Mike Turger to some extent. Um, and of course, apparently there's a whole, there's a whole um, uh, part of the United States military intelligence community, uh, which doesn't want to face the reality of this because they think it's demonic. You know, these are like uh, evangelical Christian types and they have a point. Some of them, I mean, uh, the, there, there are many, okay, let's put it this way. The physics, the physics, the basic fundamental theoretical physics that explains both consciousness, the paranormal and the propulsion of these devices is so elementary that any civilization that uh, will discover it. And we have a big universe. The uh, The rules of uh, physics and biology are universal rules. There's nothing special about the earth, you know? And, uh, and so that means that uh, there are many intelligences out there, many advanced intelligences out there who have mastered the physics involving the paranormal and consciousness and gravity, warp drive, stargates, that whole thing. And it's all real and, and uh, we're in the middle of it. So uh, even the the uh, movies and the television shows like Star, um, um, you know, Star Wars <clears throat> and uh, Star Trek. And now let me say something about, uh, okay, what, what happened was that since at least 1938, <clears throat> since since um, uh, Orson Welles did his H.G. Uh, uh, Wells' War of the Worlds radio show, which was kind of a test. They wanted to see how um, the public would react. And since uh, people got, uh, of course, people were more naive back then. In any case, w the some top people in the government knew about this even many years ago. And the question was how to handle it. So what has happened is that over the years, there's been a operation involving Hollywood. And I was partly involved in some of that. So I know directly from direct experience, this is true. Films like Close Encounters, The Third Kind, um, <clears throat> um, Back from the Future, and ma many films uh, were done to condition people to get ready for this reality. So the point is, not only are we making Star Trek real, Star Trek is real. It really is like the Federation out there. And there are some good guys and there are bad guys. You know, people are, they're not that different from us. Uh, they have all the weaknesses and failings and uh, that, that we have as well as the, uh, you know, the positive things. So um, it, it, I think that's what's going on. All right, let, let, let me continue with the next slide. Uh, unless you have something you want to add, Tim, before I go on? Well, you know, I should I should mention the Drake equation. And I just took a look at this. They keep modifying the Drake equation. I was on Wikipedia the other okay. day, though, researching it for a story. And, um, you know, there are some versions that say perhaps we're alone. But I, I think the upward yeah. round of it is thousands, could be potentially millions of alien civilizations okay. out there. So, Let me say something. Let me say something about that. I was actually at Cornell. During, you know, with Frank Drake and all these guys, Martin Howard, uh, you know, I was part of her, uh, Tommy Gold's group for a while in the uh, in the 60s. And the Drake equation is total nonsense. It's wrong, it's wrong physics. Uh, at the time, it made sense. At the time, we didn't understand, you know, at the time. Look, I remember in the 1950s, the attitude about at Cornell University, uh, Cornell University had a top physics department. All my professors were the guys who ran the Manhattan Project. My undergraduate, uh, one of my undergraduate advisors was a Nobel Prize, um, Hans Bethe, who is head of the Department of Theoretical Physics um, at uh, Los Alamos, under, directly under Oppenheimer. And uh, I remember that they didn't teach general relativity at Cornell in the 50s. And the attitude was, I remember, um, uh, I, I was in Gilbert and Sullivan shows with uh, this guy, Ronnie Parles, whose father was Rudolf Parles. Rudolf Piles was one of the top physicists at Los Alamos. And in fact, uh, uh, Ronnie was a kid. His roommate was Klaus Fuchs. Klaus Fuchs was the guy who gave the secrets of the atomic bomb to, to Joseph Stalin. And at the time, Ronnie was a graduate student in physics, staying at the house of Hans Bethe, who was my undergraduate advisor. And uh, I remember I had a discussion with Ronnie Parles. 
about uh, general relativity. And Ronnie uh, said, well, you know, it's kind of a backwater. It's not that they were ever into nuclear physics, you know, and, and high energy physics. So that was the attitude back then. And it was only um, until uh, really John Wheeler. Okay, now let's talk about John Wheeler. John Wheeler was uh, Richard Feynman's uh, thesis advisor at uh, Princeton. And uh, they started working around 1940, uh, Wheeler and Feynman, and then uh, at Princeton, uh, and th what they're working on was um, how the future affects the past, what are called advanced potentials, action at a distance, uh, classical, not quantum mechanics, classical electrodynamics. And, um, but then the war, the war came and they both went, uh, well, uh, uh, Feynman went to uh, Los Alamos, you know, with Beta and all these guys, my professors from Cornell. And uh, Wheeler, who had a background actually in, in chemistry, uh, was in charge, I think, of uh, you know, on the East Coast, the the, the isotope, um, the isotope uh, refinement to build to build the bomb. But um, in any case, what happened? So the war, the, you know, we won the war. They developed the atomic bomb, and Wheeler was basically working in nuclear physics. This is now the, the late 1940s, early 1950s, but then Roswell happens and the other, other, it's not, not only Roswell, but you know, 1947, but other crashes, retrieve craft. And uh, John Wheeler, you know, an aristocrat, Princeton professor, old New England, uh, you know, I know not New England, I guess he was Midwest, but uh, you know, from New England, from the, you know, from the, the, the Puritans, all that. Uh, any case, John Wheeler's, um, I think his cousin, I believe, was Earl Wheeler, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs around uh, the time Truman, between Truman and uh, when Eisenhower got in. So around 1952, basically, what I believe happened was that uh, General Wheeler told his cousin John, listen, John, we need to you to figure out UFOs. So uh, please, would you sign? And since uh, Wheeler was was with Einstein was still alive, and Wheeler was at Princeton with Einstein, and they uh, the, suddenly John Wheeler suddenly switched fields from nuclear physics into general relativity, you know, working with Einstein. And, and and why did he do this? I I I believe, and I can't prove this. Just my yeah, I, I knew Wheeler personally, though we never explicitly discussed this particular thing. But I believe that Wheeler was asked to switch in order for them, for the military, to try to understand these, these flying saucers. Okay. And of course, that's really what has happened. Wheeler, it was because of John Wheeler and then his students, uh, Kip Thorne. By the way, I helped Kip Thorne move into his house when he first arrived from Princeton to Caltech. I was with Richard Feynman and then his... Uh, and uh, I was yeah, hanging out with Feynman, and Feynman had this uh, this VW camper thing, whatever, the psychedelic something, you know. And he asked, he, uh, yeah, we, we actually went up and he we helped uh, Kip Thorne uh, move into, uh, into into his house, you know, unpacking the boxes, all that stuff. Uh, but in any case, uh, and of course, Kip Thorne was the technical advisor on Interstellar. And Interstellar is all about time travel at the time machine going back in time, the whole thing that uh, that I've been I've been talking about. So all these connections, you know, it, it's a pretty interesting web of of, of, of kind of Jungian synchron synchronicity, um, putting all these people into, you know, into kind of communication over many years, over what, 50, 60 years we're talking about, you know. Um, so, um, so, so, so it's because of Wheeler being asked to move from nuclear physics into general relativity that we now finally have this understanding of how these things work. Um, okay, so um, do you have anything you want to comment on what I just said, Tim, or should we go on? Well, you know, I, I would just say, I, I 
I I love the history that you're providing. I I, I think that this is incredibly valuable to help yeah. document yeah. these relationships. And you know, it it I think it adds something to it. It's more than just data. It's more than just information. It's how it evolved, and it came out of people and relationships and how they interacted and ideas. So exactly. Exa exactly. Okay. Let Let me go on to the next slide because I yeah I'm sort of going spontaneously now. This um, as things come into my mind that yeah i don't even know what i'm going to say but we'll see right <laughs> okay now uh, just to summarize uh there's this thing there's this guy lenny suskind lenny suskind is a full professor eminent professor of physics at stanford university uh and lenny and i were graduate students together at cornell in the early 1960s with this other friend of mine johnny glogauer who was actually part of the um part of this government group that that I'll talk about later. And so Lenny and I, uh, you know, our minds, if you believe, uh, if you understand now how the, all this mind control, uh, paranormal stuff works, Lenny's consciousness and my consciousness got entangled at Cornell around 1963, 1964. And um, Lenny's big thing now is called ER equals EPR. ER equals EPR, okay? And um, that's uh, also showing, has to do with the studies in quantum gravity and what is the relationship of Einstein's general theory of relativity to quantum mechanics, namely quantum entanglement, which is this, what, what Einstein called spooky telepathic action at a distance, and so it appears to be how to properly understand that. And of course, the whole thing that the uh, when the CIA uh, asked, got basically recruited me, or basically drafted me into working on these problems, um, this guy George Koopman, who was uh, kind of a spook, army actually army spook, uh, said, uh, uh, "Jack, the CIA wants to know two things: how does consciousness work, and how do flying saucers fly." I'm repeating from the last time, but this is the, this is the key thing. And those two problems, how does consciousness work? That's the EPR part. Uh, how do flying sources work? That's the uh, the ER. Uh, ER stands for Einstein Rosen. Uh, uh, Einstein and Rosen uh, in the 1930s, they basically discovered the wormhole, the thing that the movie Interstellar is based on stargates the whole thing right the, a fast way to travel you know from say an exoplanet to, to earth exoplanet could be thousands millions of light years from us but how to get through this through the stargate how to get here uh very quickly um now what happened was in 1974 1975 i had a very primitive idea of this connection that ER equals EPR. And it's actually published in a book called Space, Time and Beyond, which was published back in uh, 1975 by E.P. Dutton, first edition only, only first edition. And for various reasons, this part was taken out of other <laughs> of later editions, okay? <laughs> but if you get the first edition, which is very va valuable right now, you see, I talk about how uh, quantum entanglement and the whole idea of black holes and 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 wormholes that that was that that John Wheeler came out with black holes around that time, and also at that time Hawking was talking about black holes and how black holes evaporate the Hawking radiation. That this is now the seventies, the early nineteen seventy, late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies. So I came out with a uh, I with 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 uh, basically an anticipation of what Lenny Seskine was going to come out with only about 20 years ago. So I was like 30, maybe 30 years ahead of Lenny. But what Lenny did, of course, was much more rigorous, much more precise. And it wasn't only Lenny, other people uh, working in this. So the thing is that um, that Lenny today even says uh, GR equals QM. General relativity equals quantum mechanics in a certain sense. It's not, you know. Uh, and the idea is though, that though, though back in 1975, in the book Space Time Beyond, 
my wormholes were, were actually stargates. They were like wormholes that you could actually go through. They were little wormholes, but you could actually go through them. And the and the quantum entanglement, you could use to directly communicate. So, you know, telepathy and psychokinesis could all be explained by, by, uh, by EPR, quantum entanglement. The problem is, see, and here's the thing. The problem is that the quantum mechanics that was being taught back then, we'll call that orthodox quantum mechanics. It was like special relativity. There's a theorem because of something called unitarity, which is a big thing that Lenny Susskind, you know, depends on. Unitarity is kind of saying that information can either be created or destroyed at the fundamental level. And then uh, uh, Lenny uh, Susskind and uh, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, had a friendly debate called the Black Hole War because uh, Hawking thought that uh, quantum gravity is non-unitary in a, in a certain fundamental sense, which means energy can be, I mean, information can be created and destroyed. And this, the, the, then uh, uh, Hawking, before he died, kind of gave into Lenny and um, it's going back and forth. The argument's really still going on. There's something called the firewall paradox. You know, guys are debating whether, whether this is true or not. And um, the, uh, at the moment, it looks as though uh, Lenny is kind of winning this war, but now even Lenny himself is kind of changing because you see what's happening in post-quantum mechanics, in the quantum mechanics I am now uh, professing, the, the wormholes are traversable wormholes because now we know we have things like dark energy. Dark energy is... See, what happens in ordinary, in ordinary general relativity if you, since gravity is always attractive, what will happen is that you can have a wormhole, but it'll pinch off. And it'll pinch off so quickly that a signal cannot get through. And you, you know, Stargate, in, in conventional general relativity, Stargates, like what happened in the movie Interstellar, are not possible. If you, if you, if you try to get into a Stargate or a wormhole, you'll get crushed out of existence, kind of a, like a, sort of like a black hole, okay? And on the on the other side of that, on the complement complementary to that, or what they say is dual to that, if you try to communicate with uh, quantum entanglement, you can't because at that level, quantum entanglement is locally it's totally it's uncontrollable. So all you're going to get is is noise. Now you can communicate. You can encode information in in this entang in these entanglement patterns that are beyond space and time. You can put information in there, like sort of like a hologram. It's like a hologram, but then you need a, an additional what's called a key, uh, a classical signal to unlock that or de locally decode that information. And because the, that classical signal is limited to the speed of light, you don't get faster than light or even backwards in time in time effect effects. So as a matter of fact, uh, the Chinese communists right now are ahead of the America. They're building this big quantum uh, communications network with satellites, right? And they're relying, but here's the, here's the thing. <laughs> the, the, their system may be what, uh, like, a, a, a you know, the Maginot Line in World War, you know about the Maginot Line. Maybe some people don't know the history. In World War II, the French built this kind of, they called the Maginot Line, a, series, a bunch of forts along the, the border. And they thought it was uh, to protect themselves against Hitler. But Hitler's uh, Wehrmacht or this Blitzkrieg, you know, just, you know, just went went through it. And the, the French had an ignoble surrender and, you know, in Marshal Pétain and, you know, everything that happened then. So in the same way, uh, the current uh, uh, quantum cryptographic techniques uh, may be an illusion because they're in post quantum mechanics, you may be able to hack into these systems. Okay. So the point is that um, in, in, in the larger quantum theory, what, what we call post quantum theory, uh, EPR signaling is possible, which opens the door to all slide nine, back to what was it, back to slide nine. Uh, you see, this is all explainable. You cannot explain this with ordinary quantum mechanics. 
with the unitary quantum mechanics that Lenny Susskind was talking about, you cannot explain this. That, in fact, this in fact you could say this is impossible, and this is what a lot of people believe. A lot of the Top Gun they believe this, but they you know they're they're going to be surprised because not true, okay. But but with the logic theory, with the with the logic theory, you can explain this. And in fact, we know this is happening because we we know it's happening because of uh, vetted stories of, of of UFO contactees, you know, who have experienced mind control. And for all we know, some of our leaders may be mind controlled. That's another thing to get into because they're saying, what does it say here? The science exists. For an enemy of the United States to manipulate both physical and cognitive environments in order to penetrate U.S. facilities and influence decision makers and compromise national security. Well, who are the decision makers? He's talking about the president of the United States. He's talking about the director of national intelligence, CIA, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, on, and not only in the United States, Russia, everywhere. You understand? This kind of this kind post-quantum mechanics, this is a military thing I'm talking about here. And you better take it damn seriously, or if you don't, you're going to be screwed. In fact, we may be screwed already, maybe too late. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, and then the, this is part of the UAP threat that you mentioned. Uh, yes, this is a, this is a, of course it's part, the UAP threat because it's, because, yeah, how do I get, uh, because, yes, yeah, down here. Because it's ER equals EPR, as Lenny Suskind said. Now, in, curiously enough, in some of Lenny's latest papers, he's coming around because uh, to what I've been saying, what I uh, said in 1975 in the book Space Time Beyond. Now he's talking about there is a larger possibility in which the EPR signaling does happen and the, the wormholes are traversable. And of course we know because of dark energy is, is anti-gravity. See, once you have repulsive gravity, you can keep the the wormholes open so they become like stargates. They become traversable wormholes. But dual to that, dual to that is entanglement signaling. Now, uh, I must say this, this gets into the uh, the idea, are we living in a computer simulation? See, this idea, are we living in a computer simulation? And, um, and the thing is this, the post-quantum mechanics that I'm talking about, it's, indistinguishable from a simulation. See, because, because, because first of all, this means on, on the on the gravity side, on the ER side, uh, we have traversable wormholes, which stargates, which means you can get from one part of the universe to another part of the universe uh, almost instantly, if you like. The distance doesn't matter anymore. The billions of light years don't matter anymore, okay? And EPR, dual to that is EPR signaling, which is all the high strangeness stuff, all the, the control, all the telepathic communication that the contactees are having with the, with, you know, with the, uh, with the little green men, whatever they are, the greys or the Nordics or all these different types, the, the, the reptilians. Okay, so, uh, so, you, so, so you have that. And uh, Lenny is now saying that, well, this under certain conditions now, the, the, this may be possible. And of course, this also gets us to the movie Interstellar. What I'm saying is a lot of these science fiction stories, especially the movies coming out, I, they're not science fiction, they're science faction. You better take it really seriously because now we, the physics is there to explain all these things that were thought impossible are possible. And not only are they possible, they're real. So this also gets me to things like... Uh, like the uh, what are the what's the SCU that you just interviewed again? I forget. You know that. Oh just, yeah, yeah. Uh, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. Yeah. All and also Abby Loeb, Abby Loeb, the Project Galileo. These are all good. I encourage that. But these guys, you know, they should wake up. I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, back to Frank Drake. But the Frank Drake thing is wrong because all this UAP stuff shows that the Frank Drake equation is wrong because he was only assuming ordinary propulsion and travel limited to you know uh, less than the speed of light he didn't back then frank drake in the 60s when he did this i was there i was actually at cornell as part of who well, i was part of the space science department at cornell graduate you know graduate student for a while there and uh, so i was with these guys when they were doing all this stuff and we didn't know anything about general relativity then we knew a little but you know not, not it was very naive uh, the understanding that even 
the physics at Cornell and other places had in the in the late 50s, the early 60s uh, of general relativity was was very primitive. And uh, it was only until uh, Wheeler and Kip Thorne, these guys at Caltech, you know, years later in the 70s, 80s, really developed it. Uh, so, uh, OK. So there we are. All right, let me go on to the, OK, do you have anything you want to add or ask me to clarify? Well, you know, you'd mentioned, and this this is back a little ways, but you'd mentioned, you know, uh, being connected with Susskind, right? You yeah. said, you know, but I, I, I think it's worth mentioning that you've also been in email correspondence with all of these scientists. And I, I've seen many of these emails. You guys have back and forth discussions where you hash out the physics and go through different ideas. And so, you know, there's there is a lot of communications that goes on in, in, that I think the audience should be aware of. Yes, that's true to some extent. Let me continue with the next slide. Oh, okay. Now let's get back to what's 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 happening right now. The um the anti-gravity propulsion, which we now understand conceptually, we don't know how to do it. I mean, let me again I want to make this distinction between understanding and technological uh know-how. We understand all these things. I personally don't know how how to uh, make, say, a metamaterial that's going to do what I claim it will do, because that's a big problem, and that that's a problem that involves that's you know, uh, well, you either have to have some material from from a craft that we could reverse engineer directly, okay, or if you're doing it from scratch, then it's a matter of luck because solid state, the field of, of metamaterials, condensed matter physics is so vast and there's so much stuff to know. No one person knows all that stuff. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, to think in a few months, I had some guy, by the way, some guy who, you know, some businessman who was hoping that we build him a metamaterial in, in like six months or have at least have an experiment. So, you know, which is kind of ridiculous, you know, that it doesn't happen that way, not with uh, limited resources. Any case, the anti-gravity propulsion creates a dangerous blue shift. It's like I, it's like radiation sickness, ionizing radiation is created in the atmosphere of uh, say if you have a, a craft that's hovering like at the Skinwalker Ranch, uh, Travis Taylor, and these guys are claiming there's there's something hovering there and they've gotten sick from it, okay? And we know they've gotten sick from it because in order for something to to cancel the gravitational field and hover motionless, as some of these Tic Tacs even, you know, they're, they're seen hovering motionless above the ocean. Well, if you take a helicopter, if you're in a helicopter and if you stand under a hovering tic tac you're going to get sick man if you stand under a tool if you're too close because there's radiation ionizing radiation it's yeah it's it's like it's like uh uh the effects of a of an atomic bomb blast well not not as dramatic because it's happening over you know longer time but it's like that so in fact there have been injuries and even deaths even deaths uh from a military he, uh, military personnel who've gotten too close to the craft. And this guy, Professor Gary Nolan, Stanford, who, who's studying that. And uh, I, you know, and, uh, he's been doing a lot of uh, videos, so this is pretty well known. All right, so let, let's, let's go on. Uh, okay, the five observables, sudden instantaneous. Okay, all this stuff as we, I won't go over this right now in too much detail because we've already discussed this. Uh, all of these five observables, except maybe for the transmedium travel through 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 solids, the through water, no problem. All this is totally understood now, conceptually, in terms of a basically elementary application of Einstein's 1916 general theory, theory of relativity. It's it's not mysterious. The only thing that is mysterious is how to do all this with small amounts of energy, and that's where the metamaterial technology comes in. Okay, because basically, and let me summarize. Oh, well, let, let me go on. I'll, I'll come back to that issue. Um, all right, back to the military threat. I think we discuss. Okay, this is important. <laughs> Again, to re this bears repetition. Mm -hmm. Military 
I'm not in control. When I say the military, I, I not only mean the United States military, I mean the English, the British, the French, the NATO, Vladimir Putin, the Chinese communists. None of them, you can, they're not in control. Well, you know, and if I can interject for a moment, I think that this was something that was stated. It was overtly stated. They didn't play it up, but it was in the the uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence report where they talked about UAP incursion and training ranges, right? And that was yeah. a concern. So, the, and yeah. also the nuclear, also the nuclear, the nuclear stuff. I mean, and uh, and uh, the Rendell Sham, and uh, there's been you know a lot of information on. Uh, in fact, I think several of your people in your recent interviews have said that there's a correlation between these uh, observations and and our nuclear weapons facilities. Of course, it's no act. It's no accident that my professors built the nuclear bomb, right? Yeah, made the nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, you know, and and Jack, actually, I've done some research on this as well. And oh, yeah. w one of the things that I found was that the correlation wasn't just with weapons. It was, it was the entire nuclear supply chain. So yeah. everything from uh, processing, refining, enrichment, um, you know, the reactors, yeah. medical facilities, as well as weapons depots and transport. Yeah. Okay, and I, and I want to say that this is really important because until, until December 2017, everything I'm saying now would be considered totally insane. You know, they say Jack's, and they, some of them still say, Jack Sarfati is delusional. You know, he's a malignant narcissist, <laughs> like, like Donald Trump is. Okay. And all these things, he's crazy, you know. That, but now we say that not not so crazy now, okay? Ahead of my time, yeah, not so crazy now, okay? So I'm saying this real directly because it happens to be a fact. Now, when I say things are a fact, what do I mean by that? Empirical knowledge is never a hundred percent certain. There's something called Bayes' theorem: how to evaluate evidence with, with incomplete knowledge. I'm just saying that I'm going to be 83 years old pretty soon. And to the best of my judgment, and by the way, it, it had recently, uh, uh, you know, medical examinations. My brain was scanned, all that kind of stuff. Kit, Kit, Kit Green, you know, the CIA psychiatrist. I've spent time with Kit, Kit Green. He can, he, he will confirm. I'm, you know, I'm not crazy. <laughs> all that stuff. Okay, not delusional. But to the best of my knowledge, I'm making a model of reality, a narrative, right? And it could be wrong. See, anything in science, if if it cannot, if it's not, if it's not what's called pop or falsifiable, it's not real science. So everything I'm saying could be wrong, but so far, all the evidence and the information we're accumulating is consistent with what I'm saying. You know that we're not alone, and these these this technology is here. It's real. It's not supernatural. We do understand it. So anybody who says we don't understand what's going on. Don't trust them. Don't believe anything they're saying because either, yeah, they don't understand what's going on. I agree. They they may not understand it, but I understand it. And so uh, people I'm working, we, some of us do understand it. So so uh, or if they do understand, then they're lying for whatever you know intelligence, uh, you know mind, you know social control. What Jacques Vallée talks about, you know how the social control mechanisms and you know propaganda and you know how the all the mainstream media they. You know they're they're not really reporting accurately. They have various motivations and you know that that kind of thing. But let me just say this now: Roswell, nineteen forty-seven, really happened. Anybody says it didn't happen, either they're lying deliberately or they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, and don't trust them. Okay, don't even trust me. But let's see, you know, just just keep your your mind open but critical. Okay, so I say Roswell, nineteen forty-seven, really happened. I have several reasons for for saying that, and that's my belief now, and, and uh, other, there are other crashes as well, but also because I was part of a U.S. Army project in the late 1940s through 1950s, where their goal was to develop a cadre of uh, genius children to solve the UFO paranormal problem, okay, and that project, there was various, but one of the key, some of the key uh, people in that project was Eugene McDermott. Eugene McDermott was one of the founders of Texas Instruments, you know, a key uh, scientific intelligence guy. Uh, so just look up Eugene McDermott and a 
Professor William Sheldon was a psychologist at uh, Columbia University. And, uh, you know, Andrea Puharich, uh, Arthur Young, and to some extent, even on, uh, 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 apparently L. Ron Hubbard, uh, L. Ron Hubbard, the Scientology guy, was part of this kind of a semi-occult occult group. Uh, that were highly connected with the with the intelligence agencies at the time, World War II, OSS, that whole thing, CIA, that whole thing. Oh, also, uh, um, I know through his family, I know that uh, James Jesus Angleton, you know, the uh, the counterintelligence head of, uh, of the Central Intelligence Agency, he was very um, obsessed with the with the flying saucer issue, and I, I know this from his uh, from his grandson actually directly. Okay, all right, now, uh, and then of course I had my famous direct contact in 1953 with what claimed to be a time traveling conscious computer on board a spacecraft from the future. So all the physics I'm doing now is consistent with that with that event, okay? And the point is that this uh, this weird experience I had as a child of 13 years old, told me I would basically, they, they didn't name Hal Put. I, said, I, I would meet other people who they have also contacted in 20 years, which was when I met Hal Put off <laughs> dog, or Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut. Okay. And uh, let me get on to, okay. Do you, do you want to say anything about that? Do you want to ask me anything about what I just said? Well, no, I, I, I think that there's, there's a lot going on. I should ask with Roswell. So one of the things that, that seems with technology that that advanced how did these crashes happen presumably well that i don't know i don't claim to know everything all i know is it did happen they, they do you know uh, we've all heard the stories that maybe some of the radar uh, and by the way you know there are many different groups so the the sources that crashed could be from a intelligence that are not quite as advanced as say the tic tac is it's not just one it's not just that there's one group, there's one group of ETs or time drives out there. There are many, and they have different levels of technology. So whatever crashed then could have been from a time period in the future. It could have been us, you know, our descendants. It could have been us, but at a time when, uh, you know, the technology was not as advanced and sophisticated. You know, they would like, say, like World War II propeller planes versus jet planes. I mean, that, that sort of thing. So... I think that's pro probably yeah, but and I also uh, there's some rumors that 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 radar that that, that the, the radar from the ground based radar may have interfered with the mechanism of the saucer back then, and they were maybe fairly primitive. Okay, let me go on to to the next thing. Ah, okay. Now here's here's the thing. Uh, there's a recent interview video of Gary Nolan, the um, the. Uh, you know, the Stanford professor who was actually uh, studying classified information on the military who had got brain damage and other, uh, you know, radiation damage, also similar to the Havana syndrome that has affected our diplomats in, in Cuba and other places. And uh, uh, Gary um, uh, Gary says that, um, that uh, you know, he's a contactee. Okay, and even though, and also Jim Jim Simi Man, who works with uh, Chris Mellon and Louis Elizondo, uh, also retired from from the CIA, uh, also a contactee, has had these experiences, and I think it was Gary Nolan who says, even though some of these experiences may last only a short time, maybe a few seconds, a few minutes, they totally change the contactee's life. That's what happened to me, and it happened to other people too. So that's you know, I mean, uh, in my case, <clears throat> I only have one memory of, of of a contact, but my mother had said I was weeks of contacts, many hours, which I so I have the missing time, the whole sort of thing. Okay, but it's not just me, and even Hal Putoff, in a vague way, when I was with Hal Putoff sitting in a bus, as we were going from uh, the temple. Back to I guess a hotel. This is a this is a this is a, actually in October of uh, 2017. I was with Hal Putoff and Kit Green at this Bohm Physics Centennial because I had been I had worked with David Bohm at Birkbeck College, University of London, and um, 
you know, we were talking about some of this stuff and, and Hal, in fact, Hal more than once, I, I, yeah, when we were working with Joe Firmage back at ISSO, in fact, you know, I forgot, Hal a couple of times has, you know, he's never very direct, but he said, he, he yeah, he, he had strange contact experiences as a kid, just like I had. And Hal's a few years older than me. I, mean, I think he's three years older than me, okay? So all these guys, Bob Bigelow, uh, Joe Firmage, Uri Geller, you know, myself, uh, other people, almost every, okay, a lot of the key people involved in the military, in the Pentagon project, you know, for the UAPs, they are experiences, direct contactees, as Gary Nolan, you know, admits he is, okay? So this, this is very important. <laughs> all right. Do, should I go on, or do you want to say anything? Yeah, well, no, and I think it's interesting. So, really, what I, I think it's it's maybe even more than being in contact. It sounds like they've had a paradigm shift, right? They've had an experience that changed their paradigm. Yeah, because of because of direct contact with with you know with these entities, whatever yeah. they are, with, the, with, this, with these intelligences, and uh, and you know the whole Skinwalker Ranch thing. Uh, even Eric Davis, I believe, has had. Uh, um, you know, everybody who's been there, but Jacques Vallée, all these people. Um, okay, I mean, why did they get into this? They got into this because most of them, because they they had direct contact, and it's exactly what I was told that that uh, that uh, there was a group of us. This is back 1953, and almost all the key people today have had these kind of contact experiences. So this has to be taken into account by the people in the Pentagon, the people in the Central Intelligence Agency, the Director of National Intelligence, Senator Marco Rubio and Senator Gillibrand, bipartisan. You better wake up to this reality because this is what's this is the reality. Okay, you're not in Kansas anymore. It's not the boring universe reality that uh, you know that that, uh, that most people uh, you know. Yeah, well, and I think the takeaway that I've had is is from what you've said. This is kind of maybe you could envision this as as almost like the future creating itself, right? That was the experience you had in 1953. Yeah, well, well, that's all what the physics is telling me too. It's not just me. It's Igor Novikov in Moscow, even Kip Thorne to some extent, uh, and also you've had Frank Milburn. You had Frank Frank Milburn on several times, the British intelligence guy, and Frank. And again, uh, this is a repeat from last time. Frank has said. That his intelligence contacts do think it's time travelers. Time travels involved. No question. Okay. And also, we have now the new paper by Hal Putoff, ultra terrestrial paper. You know, he talks about all this stuff. Time. When they talk about interdimensional time travels, you can't, it's the same thing. It's a just different kind of popular, you know, language, imprecise language for, for what I'm talking about. Okay, let's go, let's go on. Uh Oh, okay. Again, back. The recent interviews of Richard Doty, who is Air Force Intelligence, Jim Semivan, CIA, Gary Nolan, Stanford, are very important in confirming the reality we're not alone in the universe. Can we repeat? On the retrieved craft, I have independence directly from a high-ranking NATO officer who actually was tasked with examining the same type of Roswell saucer that Phil Corso and Richard Doty described. <clears throat> about 30 foot diameter, weighing about 3,500 pounds, three small seats like children's size with tables with handprints, I think six fingers. The material confirmed to me by Don, now, okay, now Don Rich, uh, who just recently passed away, uh, was a tank commander in the Marine Corps and uh, a cowboy, he was a, his his father, his father worked with Kenneth Arnold up in Idaho. So Don was a little boy. I remember when Kenneth Arnold, the front guy, guy the, the pilot who uh, saw the flight of saucers, and uh, you know, uh, Don as a little boy was there when Ken Arnold was telling his dad about his flying saucer experience. Okay, and then. Uh, after Don Rich, famously, he became a quite a well-known uh, uh, sculptor. You know, in fact, he did did 
stuff at Facebook, you know, he's quite, quite uh, eminent before suddenly passing away, I think in, in March this year, early March. And, but the point is that, uh, that uh, Don was contacted by a Colonel Harry Wolf. That's what the guy called This is like 1968, 1969. And <laughs> who claimed to be, uh, well, I won't go into all the details, but it was a CIA guy named, who went under the name of Harry Wolf, a uh, former colonel, I guess, in, in the army or something. Sort of like Colonel Alexander today, right? That type of guy. And uh, Don, whose brother was also a colonel in, in the Marine Corps, Don was basically recruited by the Central Intelligence Agency to be a courier to retrieve materials from flying saucer crashes. And I get this, this is directly Don, this is Don telling me and other people. Larry Lemke, Larry Lemke, who works with Gary Nolan, Larry Lemke is a retired NASA engineer who was the direct liaison of NASA Ames with the Central Intelligence Agency. He's been to Langley many times, you know, totally into this stuff. Works with Jacques Vallée. Yeah, this is all, okay. <laughs> Larry's father was an OSS military and had direct experience with flying sources back World War II days. So you see, it's, it's a very tight network, okay? What I'm talking about. Any case, Don actually had in his possession for over a week, the, the, some of the retrieved Roswell saucer materials that are described by Colonel Philip Corso in the day after Roswell, in particular, the strut, the like the, the aluminum kind of strut with all the like Egyptian hieroglyph symbols on it. Don had it because Don had a foundry in Oakland and he was like trying to, you know, he actually had the army. It, it was a duffel bag from uh, Army Air Force Roswell ninety. I mean, this is you know double with all this stuff in it, okay. And he he, he experimented and tried. And he said that the that all this metal it hardly weighed anything. If I had to, and sometimes it almost floated. Okay, this guy's not lying. This guy's a straight arrow. Okay, he's a marine man. You know, he's a marine. All right, telling the truth. And Don had to take various pieces in the course of his work for the Central Intelligence Agency. He had to take various retrieved materials. He took it to the to MI6 in London. He delivered stuff to the French intelligence in Paris. He even went, was in Hong Kong. This is back in the 60s. Various, the uh, various, he traveled internationally, currying, you know, pieces of material to be experimented on. So now this is a fact, all right? And then I have independent confirmation. Well, I, I can't go into too much detail on that because um, I was asked not to, but every, okay, so let me get on to the next, uh, this slide. Okay, here we go. This is from Rick Doty, recent video. In fact, there's the uh, former counterintelligence office discusses area 51 class. Okay, everything in here, I claim is literally true. The captured craft was designated Cardinal 3, which was described as a 30 foot in diameter saucer shaped flying craft. The exterior was made of an unknown material, it was extremely lightweight, which corresponds to exactly what Don Rich, the late Don Rich Marine commander told me. It was made of unknown material, was extremely lightweight that could absorb sound waves. Cardinal 3 weighed 3,405 pounds. The interior of the craft contained three seating positions with handcrafted panels. There were no other convenient controls, wires, switches, knobs, or buttons. The flight control system was unknown. The propulsion system was too advanced for them. Not for me, not for Jack Sarfati. Okay. Understand by scientific personnel. Cardinal 3 was considered to be an extraterrestrial flying craft. This also, I claim, it's time traveling as well. Okay. Now, this information by Doty recently is also, of course, almost direct from Phil Corso's book, The Day After Roswell. So maybe Doty read that, I don't know. But I have independent confirmation of, let's call it Cardinal Four. See here, Doty's claiming that the US Air Force or the whatever 
that we have three of these craft, right? Three trees. But I know there's a fourth. There's a fourth in Europe in, at a NATO base, okay? From a source who knew nothing about uh, what Dodi's talking about directly and knew nothing about, uh, and had never read Phil Corsa, was surprised when I told him about the Phil Corsa book. So, you know, this is, this is, uh, this, again, I'm approaching this like a, a police detective would, you know, or counterintelligence guy would. I mean, I had a little bit of counterintelligence training at Cornell in the Air Force ROTC. You know, we all, you know, did that back in the 50s. In fact, when I graduated ROTC in 50, when was it, 58, maybe? Yeah, uh, President Eisenhower was that, you know, we had to watch past President Eisenhower and salute him, okay? All right, all right, so. This is all real. It's not. It's not science fiction. Any idiot who says it's not real, you know, is either lying or is stupid. Okay. And now, and then it's great. Now, and all these like Abby Loeb. I mean, they're looking for the obvious. Okay, good. I mean, I want them to do it. Let's see what they do. But all these guys better wake up because you know it's already these. It's here. There's no question of it anymore. Up until. December 2017, even I would not come on as strong as I'm coming on now, because now I have much more confidence that what I've experienced is the real thing. It's exactly what they said. It really was a conscious computer, because I, right now I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm working on how to make a conscious computer. Okay. All right. So let's go on. Okay. I'm at, well, this is, uh, this we've already done. This is all about you know, the smoking evidence that you've had plenty of people talk about this recently, th these guys from the scientific coalition. There's nothing new, the Nimitz, all that stuff. Ah. Okay, Matt Visser has come out with this paper showing weapons, how you can, if you can control gravity with small amounts of energy. See, he doesn't know how to do that. Matt Visser, Matt Visser is saying that this is all just theoretical, hypothetical. In fact, yeah. But here's, here, here's the weapon systems, how you can crush I mean, you can actually literally crush uh, um, uh, an airplane or a Navy ship with these gravity beams, okay? In fact, I was at, uh, in fact, you know, I worked with this guy, Ronald Pendolfi, right? Ronald Pendolfi, uh, PhD, uh, uh, I think physical chemist from UCLA, who was early in the 1980s, recruited into the Central Intelligence Agency, worked directly with, um, uh, the director of national intelligence, when that came and actually briefed many presidents in the White House, okay, and uh, he was for a while in around 2008. He was in charge of the uh, the Jasons, the Department of Defense, bunch of physicists. Actually, some of my professors at UCSD were involved in that too, uh, Keith Bruckner, and uh, I and Iran invited me to a Jason meeting in La Jolla at General Atomics on high frequency gravity waves. Paul Murad was there, there's, you know, you interviewed Paul Murad. Um, and, <laughs> uh, any case, uh, at, that, at that time, in fact, you had some of them, I think Gary Stevenson. Yeah. I think he was at that meeting. He was, who was this other guy? There's this uh, other guy. And then there was Dr. Robert Baker, I think. Baker was definitely at the meeting and I don't know if Gary was there. We're all sitting in this small room for hours. Uh, but what happened was, uh, and there was a, also a meeting at Mitra, M Mitra Corporation earlier, I think, meeting on the same subject. The problem is the Jasons, a bunch of pompous assholes, and I say most of them, <laughs> pompous assholes, Murray Gilman. No. <laughs> right. no, they poo poo. They said, no, they, they said it was all pseudoscience. They had a good argument. Their argument was that it would take too much energy to do this stuff. That the, the effects were even if they were too weak, okay. And back then, of course, I didn't. You know, I was there as a basically an observer, you know. I was I was Pendolfi's guest as an observer, and I didn't say anything because at the time I didn't know then back in two thousand eight what I now know now. So they missed something. It turns out you, you can do you can do everything that Baker and these guys were saying. With small amounts of energy, using the metamaterials, using pump metamaterials, you know. But back then, we didn't. I didn't even know what a metamaterial really, really was back then. Yeah, this is before, this is nine, this is a two thousand eight. 
Well, you know, and if, if I can interject quickly, yeah. one of the things I, I've read some of the reports from that meeting, actually, yeah. and and it, the first time I read them, it was very critical of HFGW research. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was critical of stuff that not just Stevenson, but Bob Baker, uh, Dr. Yeah. Robert Forward had, had been working on for many decades, and it seemed like very dismissive. The thing that got me, though, was when I went back and reread that, I, I, I've read that report two or three times. Okay. Um, that research was really on the verge of being classified at that point in time. And my takeaway, when I went back and read through it, reading between the lines, it almost seemed like it was intentionally dismissive to keep it open so that the work could continue. Now, that, that, that was... Okay, you uh, may be right. That, that you may be right. You may be right. But what I can say is now, um, not only are these things possible, because of what we've learned, but it's actually happened. Uh, and this is the, the thing in which I did talk about a little bit last time, that there actually was an encounter with an undersea craft at the Calypso Deep in the Mediterranean in which uh, an Italian warship was uh, sent to investigate what was allegedly uh, an underwater USO base at the Calypso Deep. 17,000 feet and uh, when they when they tried to shoot uh, like an underwater sonar or radar some kind of detection device to try to see you know image the base uh, a craft the flying saucer or two I don't, I'm not sure what the shape was as as your guy said the other day your recent thing shape doesn't matter see with warp drive the thing could be any shape it could be a box be a triangle, be a cube. It doesn't matter what it is. The shape doesn't matter because the thing is not moving through space. It's controlling the space and it's basically staying freely floating in the in the in the uh, region of warp of curvature that it's controlling with small amounts of energy. In any case, this this thing came out, shot a a beam that started uh, buckling the bow of the ship. Okay, so it's just the kind of you know these gravity beam weapons not only are possible. They exist, and uh, the uh, the intelligence that the, your Irish guy was talking about that's surveilling us has this capability, and if they wanted to use it, they could shoot our planes out of the sky. It's like War of the Worlds. We can't do anything. Our military is not in control. Now, let's see if they could allow this video to be put on YouTube, or is it going to be taken off YouTube? So um, back, you know, I'm alerting you guys, you know. <laughs> that you know I'm like uh, you know Paul Revere <laughs> you know, the British are coming the British are coming yeah well and this <laughs> goes back to the the original slide the UAP threat so yeah yeah okay so now this thing here everything here that Matt this is talking about theoretically actually exists some claim is operational and uh yeah look, this is now this is from the Matt Vista paper this is from the Matt Vista paper I guess this is worth maybe reading. Okay. Matt Visser in New Zealand. Within the context of standard general relativity, there has now been over 33 years of serious theoretical work on the possibility of traversable wormholes, 29 years of recent work on time machines, that's to the past, okay, uh, 27 years of work on the theoretical possibility of warp drives. This is not Jack Sarfati. This is now Matt Visser. He's a top, you know, he's pressed, you know, he's real academic guy. He's, he's not he's not a pirate like me. He's not a maverick guy. Uh, I'm an outlaw. But this is this is an inside guy. Okay. These analyses and their subsequent refinements are based on reverse engineering the space-time metric or the gravitational field to encapsulate some potentially interesting physics and then using the Einstein equations to deduce what the stress energy tensor must be to support these space times. This is basically what I, what I'm, what I do. Not as technically proficient perhaps as Matt Visser, okay? A distinct century old trope within science fiction is the tractor pressor beam, which is what I claim actually damaged the Italian Navy ship that tried to monitor these undersea uh, UFO bases, okay? A particular one in the Mediterranean. 
To the best of our knowledge, no really focused work has been carried out on putting track depressor beams into a coherent general relativistic context. Acoustic traffic beams, okay, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Herein we analyze, okay. So he's, okay, so here, the basic idea is to significantly modify the warp drive space times in a suitable manner, giving them a beam-like profile and analyzing the induced stresses and forces. Instead of a spaceship riding inside a warp bubble, we assume that the warp field is in the form of a beam generated to pull, repel a target. The me mechanisms by which this field is generated is beyond the scope of this article. He's an honest guy, but not beyond the scope of what Jack Sarfati's talking about. Okay. We will assume that some arbitrarily advanced civilization might, might, See, he's, he's too careful. Okay, that's good. He's a back of that. He has to worry about his grants. Might have developed the appropriate beam generation technology. Jack Sarfati says not only that, that they have. It's a fact. And it's here on Earth. And, 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 and whoever is behind this, the Tic Tac and all this USO stuff, if they want to, if they're not so friendly, they can use it. Okay? So, and they can defeat us militarily if they wish to. And you better get with this, guys, because otherwise you're not doing due diligence, the people in the militaries. All right. And uh, so this is a this is this is my key message. This imminent threat, it's here and it's real, and it's and it's now. It's happening now. Now, of course, what's gonna happen now? We don't know what's gonna happen in Ukraine. We don't know if Iran is gonna attack Israel with a nuclear bomb, if Israel is gonna counterattack. We don't know what's gonna happen with Pakistan and India, you know. So um, if, if my direct contact in 53 was correct, that they are from us and we're helping to create them, then they will intervene to prevent the nuclear holocaust. That's the best case scenario. <laughs> you know, but of course, everything I'm saying could be wrong. I could be wrong, right? Because it's empirical knowledge. I'm just giving you my best educated guess on what reality is here given all the evidence and information I have, okay, which is going to irk a lot of people and rub them the wrong way, so I'll be attacked personally <laughs> on this, but that's okay, all right? But well, let's, let, let, let's go on. Uh, all right, now, I think at this point, we've been going on enough on the military threat, and unless you have other things you want to ask me, I think I'll, I'll stop at this point and we can maybe continue on just physics related things and maybe um, in the future have some other, you know, have uh, some other people live with yeah. us. No, like that would, people, yeah. yeah, that would be wonderful. Now, what do you think? Maybe Frank, I noticed you just went through Frank's paper. The Yeah, well, I, we should do Frank Milburn, Gary, Gary Stephens. And by the way, I noticed that I'm, I'm looking at the, uh, Gary Stephenson's talk has the highest, uh, like 11, it's up to 11,000 views. Yeah, and he cited you extensively. Yes, yeah, 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 right. And then mine is second. The one you did of me is like eight, 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 almost 9,000 already. Mine is second. So there is big interest in this. So I think what you want to do, and let's not rush this, let's, let's take it through. I would have Frank Milburn. I would ask Gary Stephenson. Your Irish guy. What's his name? Ian? Oh, uh, Doctor Doctor Ian Ansbro. Yeah, he now he's less communicative, but uh, well, you know, if he's, he's willing. But I would, yeah, see if he's willing. And then you may want to have. Uh, I would ask Gary Nolan. I would ask Travis Taylor. Travis, I've been in some personal touch with Travis Taylor. He's uh, and um, so I would say like Travis, Gary Stevenson, Gary Nolan. If we come on, uh, I'd like to have Larry Lemke. If he's willing to do it, yeah. Well, look, yeah. and yeah, let's let's follow up on that on offline. Yeah, that yeah. that would be that would be relatively easy to pull together. Um, yeah. Now, well, maybe so, Chester. We have you got Chester with the general, you know, for the math, David Chester. Man. So, so one thing I wanted to ask about was um, in the past you've showed me slides with the Allison Bob and the tipped light cones. Oh yeah, right, right, and right. And it appeared now it, it 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 could be I was misreading those, but uh -huh. it appeared that when the light cone is tipped in a certain way, you can actually see into the past. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's do that. Okay. Let's start. Yeah. Let's do a little bit of physics before I quit. Okay. Good. Here's the key thing. Oh, let me come back. 
minus two. All right. The key idea common to special relativity and general relativity is what's called the light cone. It's the fundamental intuitive idea, image that physicists use to understand both special relativity without gravity and general relativity with gravity, okay? This is a, a two-dimensional version of a four-dimensional, what's called a space-time diagram. And uh, can you see my cursor? See, here's the, this is the time axis. This is time. This is, this is with respect to a particular frame of reference. And actually, they have to be what are called inertial frames of reference, which, uh, <clears throat> which uh, an inertial frame of reference, it's like freely falling in a gravitational field. Like the... Uh, our laboratories here on Earth are not inertial frames. They are what are called non-inertial frames because we're stuck to the surface, we're clamped to the surface of Earth. And because the Earth, uh, the Earth's mass energy curves the space-time that the Earth is sitting in, that actually when we're standing still on the surface of the Earth, we're actually accelerating radially, vertically upward, let's say, okay, in order not to move at all, <laughs> because space-time is curved. It's called a non-Euclidean geometry. This totally goes against our common sense, because our common sense is based on flat Euclidean geometry. And if you're accelerating, but you learn in high school, college, elementary Newtonian mechanics, that if you're accelerating, you're moving, you're going from what, you're not standing still, right? So if you accelerate in in a gravity-free, globally gravity-free field, you actually are moving, let's say, relative to the fixed stars. But in the case of the Earth, you, you have to accelerate in order not to move because the space-time is warped. And... Um, and that acceleration, there's actually what it's called. We also actually, you know, in order to stand still, we have what electrical forces of the ground. See, the electrical forces from the earth are preventing us from freely falling in the gravitational field. So that's an electric force. So what we call gravity force or weight is really an electrical reaction force. See, people. This can get very confusing, and people, even engineers, even even guys like Kevin Knuth and people like that, uh, you know, can can get confused on this. Or at least when they explain it, they're not very clear what they're talking about. And actually, I have to thank uh, Al Putoff. Actually, uh, 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 <laughs> I don't often thank Al Putoff on his on his general too, but but Hal Putoff was very good about this about making this distinction clear. So I want to give a little bit of you know, thank you to Hal. For that all right so now but the point is this every point well let's say i don't like to talk about points because come on every event everything that 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 really happens in space and time uh you think of it as a little localized region so we idealize it as a point like in, in high school geometry like a point but really what this point is not a real point you know physically it's a, it's just a small a small region of of space and time, okay? And then when we imagine all the light rays, all these things at 45 degree angles, okay? These are these are light rays. All right, now, wait a minute. What, what's a light ray? <laughs> There's a little problem here in that light is also a wave. It's what's called diffraction. So this is what's called the geometric optics limit in which the wavelengths of the light, or it could be it could be radar, it doesn't have to be light, visible, it could be x-rays, it could be gamma rays, it could be microwaves. Uh, but the wavelengths have to be small compared to the sizes of the objects that they encounter. Because otherwise, uh, you know, if they, it, 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 this is like, this, this is called the geometric optics approximation. Because if there's diffraction, this whole thing will kind of, kind of like fuzz out, you know, because it's waving, it's going to spread out. But we're just talking about now, Einstein was only talking about this geometric optics limit. And for many of our measurements, this is more than adequate, all right? So now, 
So what do we have? We have, say, here's here's a, a source. Here's, say, an emitter. Okay. Could be light coming from a UFO. Okay. And here's, now we're assuming that what are called retarded light. We're assuming that the signals only go from the present to the future, that they cannot go back in time. If they go back in time, those are called advanced waves. That's what Wheeler and Feynman in 1940 at Princeton were working on. Okay, so I'm, right now I'm going to be very naive and, and imagine that the signals can only go forward in time. You see that cursor? Can you see my little arrow? Okay, so they're going like that. On the other hand, suppose there's an emitter da down here in the past, down here. This is called the past light cone. It's the fut fut future light cone, past light cone. Okay, but imagine <clears throat> a guy here, he can send a signal forward in time, will arrive there. You, do you see that? Okay. So this is how, whenever, um, say, your talks with Kevin Knuth, everything he was talking about, he's assuming this kind of picture. He's assuming flat space time. Now, <clears throat> if you're standing still, so in this frame of reference, this is only relative to a frame of reference. And what is a frame of think of a frame of reference as a as a, as an observer, say a conscious guy, with a little detector, some kind of a detector. It could be a radar system or like you know, all the various the FLIR, what what Commander Forever had, and whatever whatever they have on board the RF eighteens and RF thirty fives, you know, for radar and all that. Those are the detectors and sensors or the sensors, right, and the detectors. So if you and this since this is a four dimensional space time diagram. Uh, in this frame of reference, if you're sitting still, that's your world line. It's called the world line. You see, it's how you see <clears throat> your space. You're standing still at the same point in space in the frame of reference. And so this is a world line. This is the guy who's not moving at all. Okay. Light moves at the maximum speed. Light is at the 45 degree angle. So any 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 machine, and this is what Kevin Knuth, when in your video, when he talks about the relativistic rocket equation, okay, talks about, he's talking about it can move, it can't move, the slope has to be less than 45 degrees. See, anything outside, this is faster than light. Anything outside the light cone, that's like a tachyon, it's going faster than light. And we can assume that's not possible. That's not. Why is it not possible? Because you, it's not possible classically to go from slower than light, this kind of motion, and cut break through the light cone like that. <clears throat> you cannot do that. <clears throat> because to do that, you need an infinite amount of energy. It's the infinite energy barrier, okay? So, so there, so, so there we are. So now let me get on to the, uh, uh, any questions? Uh, do you have any questions, Tim, about no, no, I, I do appreciate your I, going through the light cone, though. Okay. All right. So now let's go. On. Okay. Now, okay, there's a good article. Everybody can just Google Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, <clears throat> Light Cones and Causal Structure. They explain everything I'm trying to explain in great detail. So kids, do your homework, study this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Make it start making a lot more sense. But these are difficult ideas. It's, you know, you just can't get this. It's not like going on 20 questions or, uh, you know, and suddenly you understand it. Okay. So it's difficult, most people. All right. All right. Now, again, everything in your Kevin, in Kevin Knuth's lecture that he talked about is special relativity. His relativistic rocket degree is correct for special relativity, which means no gravity. Basically, gravity is forgotten about in any real sense. So what happens is, this is like a, a picture of what the light cones look like in flat space-time. There's no, there's no gravity field, there's no curvature. Gravity is curvature, you see? So all the light cones are all, it's like, think of like spins in a ferromagnet. Every, well, all the light cones are lined up with each other. They're all parallel to each other on the space-time diagram, okay? So which means that, for example, okay, look, can you see my cursor here? This, a person here can communicate to this guy up here, 
because here the future light cone of this sender is the same intersects the past light cone of the receiver. See, so you can go like that. These are all I, this is possible. All these lines are good. Every every line that goes at forty five degrees is a possible communication link in this flat space time. Okay, with retarded signals, we're showing now no advanced spooky. Uh, advanced signals, okay? But that's another issue. I don't even want to get into that at this point. This is confusing enough. All right. So this is special relativity, no gravity. <clears throat> this is where Kevin Knuth, again, his relativistic rocket, everything he said is correct, if that's your picture. But he says it's correct. But he's, he's asking the wrong question, giving the right answer to the wrong question as far as UFOs are concerned. So that's my point. All right. Now, okay, this is just now a close up. Again, the red triangles are the future light cones, the blue triangles are the past light cones. And Bob, and Bob, Bob can send a signal to Alice because Bob, the signal goes, the light ray goes from past to future along this line and into Alice's detector. Okay, so these are called cause, cause, causal relations causality relations, retarded causality. Conventional idea that you only have past causes of present effects. Okay. All right. So that's the picture. All right. And this is special relativity. Now, this, this is where there's no gravity involved at all. That's the situation. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay. Now, <clears throat> most people, and even some of the Alcuberi, <clears throat> even some of the Alcuberi metrics, all the all the stuff on the warp drive metrics you're reading, they are making a big mistake. I believe I could be wrong here, but I'm giving them could be wrong because when they talk about FTL warp drive, they're doing it inconsistently. They're picturing this situation. They're picturing that. They're picturing that the uh, that the UFO is actually outside of it, of the light cone. Okay, that's doing this kind of thing, and if it does do this, then you get all kinds of illusion. It, if it does do this sort of thing, then you get a result that uh, who's ever on board the UFO in fast and light warp drive cannot see ahead of them. This, they call it this. It's a bad, like an event horizon, future event, uh, event horizon. So they can't they can't navigate. They won't be able to navigate. Now, the reason they're making this mistake, they're making this mistake because when they write down their gravitational field picture, okay, it's kind of like the same mistake that Kevin Knuth made and that they're, they're getting the right answer to the wrong question. What they're asking, and by the way, Hal Putoff does this as well, makes the same mistake in his uh, polarized vacuum Theory, the you know, the stuff that on uh, the metric. Now, Hal Potter has these metric engineering papers, which he said, which the you know, which, and, and he's made the same mistake. He's what they're doing, they're writing down what a distant observer outside the warp field, an observer outside the the, the flying saucer sees. Okay, what they see, and what they think, what the distant observer thinks the guys inside are going to see. But so, but that's not the case because we, we know in general relativity, for example, if you have an extended mass, you have a gravitational field inside what's called the interior solution. And then you have the exterior, so what the outside guy sees. Then you have a boundary condition. You, know, you have to match up these two metrics, but they're not the same. The, the interior metric is not the same as the uh, exterior metric. So what the guy inside the warp bubble sees, it's not the same kind of gravity field that the outside observer extrapolates and thinks he's going to see, the inside's going to see. And they do have to, ma you do have to match them up at some point, just call it at the interface, you have to match them up. But this is all non-trivial stuff, okay. So what I'm saying is that they've asked the, uh, uh, everything that they're talking about, most of these papers is misguided I believe on this issue. 
They'll give the correct answers to what the outside observer sees, but not going to give the correct answer to what's going on inside, which is what's important. Okay, so let, let, let me go on. So let me... Uh, all right, now, this is from the Stanford article on light cones showing, based on really what, what Roger Penrose came up with these nice little pictures originally. I believe, I believe it's Penrose. The way to picture gravitational fields intuitively is simply the tilt, the relative tilting of the light cones. This is, this is a collapsing star. This is time, space. So it's a collapsing star. Okay, and this is the this is the surf. This is going to be actually the surface of the collapsing star, and and what happens is, uh, I, I I really can't. If you watch my cursor, it's going to be a little light cone like this. So what's going to happen is that uh, what that that what's going to happen is that the uh, there's going to be an event horizon here, and you have what's called a one way membrane where light can get into the surface but cannot get back out. Classically speaking, light rays, classical light rays. Turns out we include quantum mechanical tunneling effects. Some of the light rays can get out, and that's the Hawking radiation black holes evaporate. But this is the this is the naive classical picture. But this picture is pretty accurate for large for large black holes. The leakage of the Hawking radiation is you know so small it takes billions of years. Forget about it. Okay. All right. And here we have, uh, <clears throat> okay, so, so just repeating what I said, this is on the Stanford Encyclopedia. We have a black hole when the curvature of space-time becomes so severe that for some region, there is no path out of the region that remains inside its own light cones. That is, the causal structure of the space-time is such that one cannot escape from that region without traveling faster than light, faster than light, meaning uh, without traveling faster than light, and this, this is, they're talking about this, without doing this, okay? Without traveling fast and light. Such a region is by definition a black hole. The border of that region is the event horizon. Okay. The white hole is just the reverse of this. The white hole is the time reverse. So anything inside can get out in the white hole, but nothing on the outside can get in. That's your force shield idea, okay? Okay that we may be able to create. The point is with the metamaterial technology, I think we can make inside balls and metamaterials, we can either make artificial black holes or artificial white holes. If we make a white hole, we have the beginning of what may be an impenetrable force shield. Okay, now, uh, what I want to say is now, both Travis Taylor and some of my NATO friend, friends they tried to shoot missiles against the flying saucers. Okay. What happens? The missiles either crash, they, they bounce back. <laughs> that looks like a white hole. Okay. So, so this may be more than theoretical. There's some evidence here, folklore, not, uh, may, I guess most of it would be classified, obviously, right? Classified. That could have, yeah. 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 <laughs> So this has to be taken very seriously, not just theory anymore. Okay. Well, yeah. And then there are a lot of anecdotes, too, um, yeah. that, that just aren't like, for instance, uh, one of the ones that I'd like to learn more about is uh, there's uh, there are some log files that show they were trying to fire grappling hooks at UAPs in the USS Kidd incident. Yeah. So and yeah. there wasn't really any I I'm assuming they bounced off or never made it. But. Yeah. Okay. So you know. So this is this technology is not just theoretical. I'm claiming it's operational, except the U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy, the Russian Navy, the Chinese Navy, the the NATO navies. They don't have it. They don't have it, but somebody's got it. Okay. And let's go on. All right. Now. Okay. Okay. Well, here was a. Okay. So here was the. Okay. Here's the black hole picture. See. And and here is the white hole picture. Okay, see in the black hole, in in the black hole picture. See here's the forward light cone. See at the event horizon, the forward light cone is right at the surface of this thing. Inside, it's even more inside the forward light cone will be here. So so all all the all the revert all the retarded information 
whoop, he's stuck. So you can't get out. Here, here it's just the opposite. Here, everything gets out, but, but nothing can get in. All right, so now, so it's this. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go on with that. All right, now, if you can, if Alice, and Alice is now in the UFO, okay, Alice is now in the UFO. The whole idea of what Alice can do, and Alice might be a conscious computer, artificial intelligence, like HAL 2000, right? Okay, except it's conscious, according to him. Alice is able, what warp drive means is Alice is able to control the orientation of her local light cone relative to the light cones of the, of the guys outside the warp field. Okay. That's so what we have to do. If, if I could, so if I could jump yeah. in really quick. In this picture, it looks like Alice is communicating or at least visible back in time with Bob, right? Well, okay, no, 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 wait, wait. Okay, but I'll get to that. Wait, wait. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's just hear. Okay. The, the red triangle is the future icon of Alice, this one. This red triangle is the future icon of Bob. These are their past icons. Okay. So now, Let's wait. Let's get back first. Let's just uh, let me get back to this one. Ah, here, look what's happening. This is without gravity. Flat. There's no. There's no. There's no real gravitational curvature field here. Here, what's happening? Bob is the sender. Alice is the receiver. In this case, Bob's red future light cone matches Alice's blue past light cone. Okay, so here, so Bob can send a retarded signal to Alice. Okay, but but here it, it's the it's Alice's blue matches connects with Bob's red. Okay, that's no gravity, flat space time. So let's get back to here. It's a it's it's a it's a different situation. Here, Bob's red matches Alice's red. But here's the blue man is Alice's past. Okay. So now, but Bob, I see Alice is moving in the horizontal direction in this picture. Alice is moving like my the my cursor. You see Alice is moving this way, right? Okay. So Bob is in front of Alice here now, right? Bob's in front of him, but in the past, Bob's in front of Alice. See, this, this is Bob's world line is going vertically up. Alice's, Alice's world line is perpendicular to Bob's world line. Okay. So what's happening here is that Bob is ahead, is in front, you know. Okay, say Bob is on Mars. Alice has come from Earth, and Alice here is halfway between Earth and Mars, right? So Alice can see what's ahead of her, but in the past, but that's the same as that's no different from what happens even when there's no gravity. See here, when there's no gravity here, uh, Alice is sort of okay. Alice is inside her light cone. Alice's world line is like going like this inside the red tri uh, red triangle, but Bob is in front of her, so Alice is seeing. So Alice sees Bob, who's in front of her. See, Alice is heading toward Bob, but at this angle, you know, she's not doing, she's going slow now. Alice is going like this inside a light cone. She's she's approaching Bob, but she sees Bob in, in the past. That's our situation. I mean, whenever we see what's ahead of us, we're seeing the past, but because the distance is so small and the speed of light is so big, it's like it's instantaneous. But for space travel, that's not the case anymore. You know, when you get a message from the moon, it's what, two seconds behind. If you were to get a message from the sun, well, from, from Mars, it'd be what, a couple of minutes, whatever the hell, the time delay from light travel time, right? Yeah, I think it's like four minutes from Mars, right? Yeah, well, so, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure. I don't know. Look for them. I forgot. Okay. But here, okay, here the situation, you see now, Alice, it's almost like there's no, it's almost like there's no gravity, but Alice is seeing Bob in her future, but no problem. There's no event. There's there's no navigation problem. Let's put it this way. Alice in 
fast and light warp drive is able to navigate as easily, really, as if there was no gravity. Okay. But now, but there are some weird things. Let's go to uh, let's go to the next picture. Okay, so he, so here's the thing. In fact, I have a better picture. I think the next picture is here. So okay, so here's Earth. This is for Elon Musk. Here's his Mars, and here's Alice in her Tic Tac flying saucer going from Earth to Mars in maybe what? Maybe in ten minutes. <laughs> so many chances to collide with it. Well, let's say you know this, one. but a lot faster than 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 Elon Musk's rocket. It's going to take about six months. Forget it. Stupid. All right. All right. So the next picture is okay. Ah, next picture is this. And I, I got to get my friend Julian to put these pair. I need the past light cones here so it'll become clearer. But here, so here's the picture. Here is a uh, C. This is on Mars. Light cone Alice at A sees what's ahead of her at C, but in the past, in her, you know, in the past. But look what's happening here. Okay, look at this. Okay, I drew a, a, a past light cone here. This, here's a past light cone. Here, Alice is, you know, is seeing, oh, here's, See, a light signal is coming from here up to Alice's past light cone there. She's seeing that thing in the past. Okay. But if you just imagine here, see here, she's been seeing, she's seeing a, a, a signal, say, from there. If you just draw the light cone, the 40, which is meant to light cone. So as Alice moves toward Mars, she's getting signals from Earth from earlier and earlier times. So Alice's receiver, in other words, if Alice's telescope or receivers are pointed toward Earth in her in her FTL trip, okay, as she gets closer to Mars, she's getting images that are going backwards in time. Can you see that just from the picture? Just from see, see here it's going here, and say here, here's a, it's going there. See here, that just past light on forty five degree, this point. This point's communicating with Alice here. And that's in the future, this point. So, so there's a time so that you can literally see backwards in time. Well, what does this mean? Suppose Elon Musk and, and uh, Bob Bigelow and these guys, they get together and they, you know, Bob Bigelow has his space hotels, but they're using the Sarfati warp drive now. Okay, they're not using stupid Chinese firecracker ro giant rockets, which are ridiculous. And dangerous, and bad for the environment. <laughs> yeah, right. Bad for the atmosphere, burning up the atmosphere, shooting these stupid things off. So instead, we have a fleet. We now have our. Um, in fact, uh, in fact, um, your guy, your Irish guy, actually had a picture of one of these uh, tourist Tic Tacs. Mm. <laughs> it's not only going to go backwards in time travel, but it can also. The, the point is. You can actually see, you can actually get tele, you can actually get images, telescope pictures. If you have good, strong enough telescope, we can go by going fast and light warp drive out in space, and uh, uh, targeting your cameras on the Earth. You can see back. You can see the Earth in in the past. Maybe arbitrary. You can see Jesus on the cross. Maybe even see the Big Bang. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I mean, you can see the history of the Earth. We're talking about the Earth. You can see how the Earth was formed. You see all this stuff. Light signals coming from, you know, just. So there's that. So this is big tech. I mean, this is big. What can be bigger than that? That's yeah. Big, yeah. Right? <laughs> and this is simple. This just comes from, from uh, using Roger Penrose's uh, technique of light cone pictures. And uh, Albert Cuvieri, none of these guys seem to realize this. Not even that Matt Vissett has this, this idea. I don't think so. I haven't seen it anywhere else. Yeah, I again, I just thought of this a couple of weeks ago when I was trying to communicate some imagery. I wanted uh, Julian Geffrey to draw some pictures and I had some stupid way of doing it. I realized I was wrong because I was thinking the way Al Berry's thinking and all these guys. And the man the, is oh, stupid. We, you know, we're stupid. Sometimes we make mistakes, right? Big mistake. All right. So this, so this, is, this is how you can actually see into the past using an FTL warp drive, properly understood. Okay, and then, uh, but in addition to that, you can actually literally go back in time, travel back in time. 
And this is where uh, the head, the, next time I'll, I'll get the image, your Irish guy had a really nice picture of a, of a Tic Tac with portholes in it. You know, which was like a tourist bus, <laughs> like a Tic Tac warp drive tourist bus going backwards in time. We could have uh, the Christians who want to see Jesus on the cross would really happen, that it could happen. I mean, you know, this is all real. It's not just science fiction I'm talking about. I, I mean this literally. Yeah. Yeah. You go back in time. And 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 in this particular thing, now there are some problems that Kip Thorne and Hawking were debating. See, if you try to do it, if you try to use a wormhole to go back in time, there is what's called an instability problem, maybe. And that as soon as the wormhole Stargate becomes a time machine enabling to go to the past, um, you have an instability and the thing will blow up, the thing will explode. But this this particular, with just with the warp drive controlling the light cone structure, see, that avoids that because it's it's kind of, you don't have a close, it's like, it's like when you close a circuit, electrical circuit, you know, the current flows. In this case, it's 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 um it's a short circuit. You don't close the thing, so you don't get the instability. But you do get see here here. Uh, in this case, suppose this is Alice going and she Alice is doing this. So now here we have two Alice's. You know, we have old Alice, but Alice ages, you know. And see the local proper time, she's still aging inside this, this what's called proper time. She's still aging. So this is older Alice. It's not it's not identical to, to, to younger Alice, but they can meet and talk to. In fact, they can talk to each other. And by the way, uh, uh, David Deutsch and other physicists, they've gone through all this, you know, all the possibilities. And all this can be done without any paradoxes. So that's another thing. We, we have to have a, a separate discussion on the time travel paradoxes are all illusionary. There are no real paradoxes. You can avoid them. And in fact, certain things that people think of paradoxes are not paradoxes at all. That's actually just the way things work. That's another thing. But I think I think I think uh, we should reserve that for another another time, huh? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So have, have any last thing you want to say? No, no. But Jack, let me thank you very much for your time today. Yeah. Okay. And we'll Let's try to get together with some of these other people for a debate discussion.